What if I told you the most feared team in the Premier League right now was a villain? A menace to England's elite. A complete meta-breaker that just knocked Arsenal from the top of the league. And is the only team that I can remember, maybe ever, to completely homeschool a Pep Guardiola treble-winning Manchester City side. And what if I told you that the mastermind who was responsible for this disruption was just a couple years ago labeled a failure, a loser, and a meme generator. And if I could go back in time just a year ago and said on this channel that this team and this manager would be the most feared team in Europe, you would have me committed to a psych ward. But this is the bizarre world we're living in now, buddy. And I get it. Everybody loves Brighton's story, and the early season heroics of post Custacoglu Spurs stole all the headlines. But like the Grinch planning for Christmas, Unai Emery and this Aston Villa side are planning to steal it all. They are fresh off of two miraculous wins. They gave the reigning champions Manchester City what can best be described as a 90-minute dominatrix session and followed by Unai Emery getting his revenge up against the team that let him go four years ago. And in the process, knocking Arsenal off the top of the league. There's no questions about it. Aston Villa are the surprise team of the season. As of recording this, the villains sit third in the league, above early darlings Tottenham, above newly oil money crowned Newcastle, above every hipster favorites team Brighton, and now two points above the greatest football team in the world, Man City, and just one point off the team that sacked Unai Emery four years ago in Arsenal, and two points off the league leaders Liverpool. What Aston Villa has been able to accomplish in a year's time should only be possible in FIFA career mode. Because this was no crazy ownership overhaul, no billion dollar spending spree, not even some new bright face manager labeled as the next Pep Guardiola. No, this is mostly the same squad with the manager that many had already written off as a man who couldn't cut it in the Premier League. So how do they turn around? Well, to understand that, I need to take you back to the start of Unai Emery's villain arc. But quickly before that, I need to pay my rent. Oh, hey guys, it's your favorite fat Asian, and with the New Year's right around the corner, I'm gonna stay the skinny Asian by doing the only thing that's ever worked for me. Low carb, keto. Which is why I love factory meal plans. F cooking, F counting macros, F going to the grocery store. With Factor, your pro dietitians do all that shit for you, which leaves you more energy and time to do the things that you actually wanna do. Like watching Christian Pulsic tear it up in Italy. Just put in your order online and Factor will deliver fresh, never frozen, delicious meals to your door. And anytime you're feeling a bit peckish, go ahead and poke a few holes in that bitch, microwave it for two minutes, and you're eating something nutritious and delicious. And if you wanna treat yourself to something a little bit extra during this holiday season, why not indulge in a little gourmet plus? Get a little surf and turf, or my personal favorite, the truffle filet mignon. For less than that dusty order of Uber Eats, you can be eating truffle filet mignon. It's no contest. So if you wanna optimize your life, you owe it to yourself to try at least one box of Factor. So head over to factor75.com or hit the link in the top of the description. And if you use code B-50 at checkout, you'll get 50% off your first box. Once again, that is factor75.com and use the code B-50 for 50% off your first box. The link is in the top of the doobly-doo. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the show. Factor, we're being honest, everyone one year ago had written this team off. But the villains decided not to write back. Because let me take you back. Do you remember where Aston Villa was a year ago? Two measly wins in 11 games, languishing in 16th place, heading into a World Cup break, and seemingly faded for a relegation battle for the rest of the year. And with that, they would make a decision that would change the fate of their club. They cut ties with Stevie G and opted to bring in the Europa League god himself, Unai Emery. Now, Unai is probably most well-known by many English speakers as the guy from the good evening memes. What do you make of what you've seen this evening? Good evening. Good evening, when get out you was treasoning Just for that they should leave him in Let man bring the whole season in But more so as the manager who failed at Arsenal And maybe unfairly so As looking back, the game was rigged from the start For Unai was given an impossible task in North London Replacing a literal legend of the game in Arson Winger Someone is venerated and beloved not only by Gunner fans But by the sport as a whole How do you even replace someone who gave the world the Invincibles? You can't Unai never captured any civil war with Arsenal, and because of that, he was seen as a flop. But even in his failure, we saw seeds of what he and Arsenal would become. Because many forget that it was Unai that introduced Bakayo Saka and Gabriel Martinelli into Arsenal's first team, and brought a rotting corpse of a roster to the precipice of Europa League glory. All of that is mostly forgotten now, with Mikel Arteta seen as the architect for this new, brilliant Arsenal side we see today. But let history note that Unai Emery died so that Mikel Arteta could fly. 
Unai's time at Arsenal was defined by his lack of control. He took over a club in flux, inheriting a squad that had missed out on Champions League for the first time in 16 years. It was rapidly aging, decrepit, and had serious dressing room issues. Emery, when talking to the Athletic, said, quote, Five captains in the first year. There were many changes and patience was needed. Xhaka had problems with the fans and in the dressing room, where other experienced players did not understand his role as captain. He also lacked control in the transfers that came in, which frankly, during his time at Arsenal, was a colossal waste of money. There were players that simply did not fit his system and thus gave very little impact when put on the pitch. He also lacked the support system around him. He was pulled in too many directions, which didn't allow him to focus on the one thing that he is masterful at, breaking down film and creating a hyper-detailed tactical plan specific to each opponent he faces. Because even with all the troubles that he had at Arsenal, he was still able to work his Europa League magic, guiding Arsenal all the way to the Europa League final. Sadly, he did lose 4-1 to London rivals Chelsea, but I'd like to note that this was also his only Europa League final loss in his five appearances. But unfortunately, the progress he was making at Arsenal wasn't quick enough. The board got impatient, and after a string of inconsistent results that culminated in a seven-game winless streak, Arsenal's board gave Unai the sack. Now this earned Unai a bit of a reputation, perhaps unjustly, as a manager that has never been able to cut it at the highest level. Whenever he's managed the biggest teams in the world, like PSG or Arsenal, he just couldn't deliver the goods. Even with a couple of domestic trophies in hand during his time at PSG, his inability to progress them in the Champions League and lack of control of a star-studded dressing room were the reasons why he opted to leave Paris with a year still left on his contract. But despite all these failings, Unai has always been elite at one thing his entire career. He is, undeniably, the Europa League master. The man won three Europa League titles with Sevilla, he made the finals with Arsenal, and after leaving Arsenal, he won yet another Europa League title with Villarreal. And this wasn't against no scrubs. He won finals up against the likes of Liverpool and Manchester United. And now, he's working that Espana magic all over Aston Villa. Or at this point, their fans should be calling them Aston Villa. Now, a little backstory on Aston Villa, because they might not be the most well-known team overseas, but they are, in fact, one of the most successful teams in English history. Because check out the trophy habit. They have seven English League titles, seven FA Cups, five League Cups, a European Cup, which is the precursor to the Champions League, and they have a European Super Cup. But most people outside of England don't know that because they've sucked dick for the last decade. In fact, they were relegated as recently as 2016 and didn't return to the top flight of English football until the 2020 season. And the season they did get back, they barely avoided relegation, dodging that shit on the final day of the season. They followed that up in 11 place finish in the following year, spelled progress for then manager Dean Smith, who had guided them up from the championship. But his failure to convince Jack Grealish to stay and a poor start in the 2021 campaign, some sacked in favor of Liverpool legend Stephen G, who had previously enjoyed a stint at Scottish club Rangers, where he ended a run of dominance of their longtime bitter rivals, Celtic. So there was much optimism with his appointment in Aston Villa, but my man was catastrophic. And after another dreadful start to the season that saw two wins in the first 11 games, they showed Stevie G his pink slips and brought in Unai Emery. Now Unai, during his time in exile from the Prem, had a very successful stint with La Liga side Villarreal. Naturally, he captured his fourth Europa League title. But maybe more impressively, during their 2022 Champions League campaign, he led Villarreal all the way to a semi-finals appearance where they actually gave an all-time Liverpool squad quite a scare. And this was no cupcake walk through the bracket. To get to the semis, they had to knock out European royalty, Juventus, and Bayern Munich. In the away match versus Bayern, he famously asked his team to be brave, have them take zero long throws, and ask the center back and keeper not to play the ball long. Instead, Villarreal played out of the back, packed the midfield, and trusted that their neat little triangles could hold up against the juggernaut that is Bayern. Emery correctly identified that this would lure out Bayern's press, and with patience, slowly pull apart gaps in Byron's midfield. Gaps that they were able to exploit to get a 1-1 result away from home, which combined with the 1-0 victory in the first leg was enough to slay the German dynasty. And to make this possible, Unai had to instill Villarreal with a sense of fearlessness. The players had to trust that if they prepared, drilled meticulously, and stuck to the gaffer's game plan, that not only could they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any team in the world, they could beat them. This man clearly has world-class talent when it comes to a tournament format, minus the time at PSG. Now his success at Villarreal began to garner him interest in England once again, and soon he was approached to fill a vacant managerial role at Newcastle, and this is post the club's purchase by the Saudi royal family. 
Mm-hmm. Unai could have been the face of Newcastle's oil money rebirth. But curiously, the Spaniard turned them down due to what he said was the club's lack of a clear vision, which makes it all the more intriguing to why he took a lesser status job at Aston Villa. And this is me just reading between the lines, but maybe his time at PSG, another newly minted oil money club, gave him insight into what Newcastle might become, and all the potential headaches that being a manager for that type of owner brought with it. But make no mistake about it, he declined to take over a team that had the potential to become the next Manchester City in favor of taking over Aston Villa, a team that had the potential of being relegated. It was a very curious decision at the time, but nonetheless, Unai was bought out of the remainder of his Villarreal contract and became the manager of Aston Villa Football Club on October 24th, 2022. And not only did he successfully keep them out of the drop zone that year, over the course of the season, he took them from 16th place to 7th. Yes, this Spanish warlock conjured up an insane number of points over the final two-thirds of the season to take the villains from the drop zone to the European zone, beating out media darlings Brentford and Tottenham on the final day of the season to earn their spot in the Conference League this year. In fact, and this stat blew my mind, since Unai Emery's appointment at Aston Villa, the only teams that have picked up more points over that stretch in the Premier League have been Man City and Liverpool. No one talks about this, but Unai came back to the Premier League with a smaller club and has since scored more points than the team that let him go in Arsenal. And that is righteous. And you know, you know Unai popped some champagne when Arsenal bottled the league. Get fucked, Arsenal. And what's even wilder is that over this stretch, Emery has pretty much never had his first choice of a starting 11. The team has been one of the most injured squads since he's taken over, and the man still gets results. This speaks to a manager who is insanely tactically versatile. A man who every week has been able to create a new, unique game plan that suited both the players that he had available while countering the opponents that he was up against. In an interview with The Athletic last year, Arnaud Danjuma said this, Unai is crazy about football, and that is a good thing. Every game, he comes up with a different plan, the best strategy, the best way he thinks we can beat the opponent. The bigger the games, the more details he gives us as well. Meticulous, bordering on the obsessive, is often used to describe Unai Emery's managerial style. He very famously watched 17 matches of Manchester United before beating them in the Europa League final. He is infamous for his often long weekly tactical meetings that involved hyper-detailed video analysis of not just their opponent's tactics, but of the individual players that they'll be going up against. Meetings can often run over schedule, with Unai unafraid to repeat himself, or have them redo a drill multiple times in training until the team gets it right. This ceaseless dedication to preparation could wear on players, but if the squad can buy in, and if they see that the gaffer actually knows what he's talking about, then you can galvanize the squad into a club that believes that they can win no matter the opponent. That fearlessness is what he instilled at Sevilla, at Villarreal, and has now manifested itself at Aston Villa. Look no further than their complete schooling of the trouble-winning champions. I am pressed to remember a team that has played that fearlessly against a Pep Guardiola Man City team, maybe ever, at least in the Premier League. And now you look at the scoreline, it's 1-0, but let me tell you, that is a very flattering scoreline. Anyone who actually watched the match will tell you it could have easily been 5-0. It was that much of a drubbing. They battered Man City like a drunk husband in the 1920s. The way they kept Man City pended like 11 newborn sheep, it was unbelievable to watch. You would have thought that the villains had switched shirts with the treble-winning champions before the match. And this wasn't the only tactical masterclass he's put on this season. Every football hipster's favorite club right now, Brighton, got off to a flying start. They were scoring more goals than anyone at the start of the season, and Roberto De Zerbi was being labeled as a managerial mad genius. But then they played Aston Villa, and what happened? They got eviscerated 6-1, and frankly, they haven't been the same since. Unai and this Villa team have just been putting tape on how to break down some of the best tactical minds in modern football, with a team that has just got that dog in them. And let me remind you, this is not some completely rebuilt side by a new billionaire owner trying to prove that his PP is really big. No, no. In fact, aside from just a few notable additions, this is mostly the same squad that was fighting off relegation just a year ago. When he took over, he was reunited with the goalkeeper he was familiar with during his time at Arsenal. Of course, I'm talking about Envy Martinez. You might remember him. He's the guy who did this. The cocky and often brash Argentine's heroics at the World Cup earned him the honor of humping the Golden Glove Award in front of the Qatari royal family last Christmas. And he then parlayed that performance in a strong showing for the villains into winning the award for being the best goalkeeper in the world. Yeah, it's weird to say, 
but Aston Villa technically have the best goalkeeper in the world right now. And while it's debatable if Emmy is actually better than Alisson, there is no debate that he's a key cog in Emery's team. A calming presence with good enough passing range to facilitate Unai's play out from the back system. And when called upon, his shot stopping heroics have saved the asses for both club and country many times over these past two years. Ollie Watkins was a much hyped prospect from his time in the lower divisions, but at the age of 27, he had been labeled by many as a flop, just another one of these wonderkins unable to cut it in England's top flight. But under Unai's coaching, Watkins has been reborn into a top five striker in the league. He went from starting on the bench under Steven Gerrard to now being fifth in the Premier League for goals scored this season. He had a purple patch last year that saw him score in six consecutive away games, a sensational run of games that not only was crucial for Villa securing European football this year, but it was a feat that had not been done in the Premier League since Sergio Aguero did it for Man City. That is the level that Unai has got these former losers playing at. So what were the changes that Unai had Ollie make? Well. His instructions were simple. Stay in the box. When making runs, aim for the box. You see the area outside of the box? Don't go there. From now on, you live in the box. Stay in the box. Unai had seen all his underlying metrics and correctly diagnosed that his greatest strength wasn't his pace, wasn't his strength, it was his shot accuracy. In fact, last season, of players who had taken a minimum of 50 shots, no player in Europe's top five leagues was more accurate than one Ollie Watkins. And that shot accuracy was being wasted when he wasn't in the box. Then you have the captain of Aston Villa, John McGinn, who a year ago looked like he was on the way out. But under Unai, he is transformed into the Scottish Javi. The captain for Unai's Villa is not only a talismanic leader on and off the pitch, but he might be the single most important player in Unai's team. In fact, his presence has accounted for the highest accepted win percentage of any player in the squad. Douglas Weiss has become a 100 million pound target for Europe's elite. The midfield maestro has become Villa's second top scorer since Unai's appointment, driving himself 10 goals and seven assists. And with his performance, absolutely bossing in the middle of the park versus Man City, you know Douglas Louise was loving it because it was one Pep Guardiola that ended up selling the young Brazilian to the villains all the way back in 2019. And I'm pretty sure now Pep wishes he had that one back. Leon Bailey probably had the best game of his career versus the champions, constantly turning markers and terrorizing Man City's back line all game long. The man looked like he had rockets up his ass. And all these players were already on Villa. But yes, he's had a few notable transfers. Yuri Telemans, on a free from Leicester, has been a solid addition. Same goes for the speedy Musa Diaby. But probably the most important addition to the squad was the signing of a familiar face from his time at Villarreal. Paul Torres, arguably his best player at Villarreal, the elegant ball playing center back, has become integral to a nice style of building up play from the back. He shook off a rocky start at the club to become one of the best passing center backs in the Premier League and actually ranked second best in forward passes under pressure this year. And these are just a few examples of how Unai and his coaching backroom have gone one by one, broken down and rebuilt every player on this squad to become something greater than the sum of their parts. Because you gotta remember, they don't have the budget to buy the best players in the world like Man City. They don't have the exciting young talents or the prestige of a club like Arsenal. Hell, they don't even have as good of a scouting department as Brighton. You can easily argue all three of those teams have a far superior roster than Aston Villa. But Unai beat them all. He is, for my fighting game fans, a low-tier god, picking Yoshi in Smash Melee and winning majors by slaying the gods of the game. That is what's happening here. So it begs the question, why did this never work for bigger clubs? Why did the players at PSG lose faith in his tactics? While seemingly every mid-table team he's coached, their players will run through a wall for this man. Like seriously, you give you and I a mid-table team, he is like a pig in slop. It's just his element. And maybe he isn't made for a giant. Unai is just more comfortable in the role of giant killer. The mid-table is his comfort zone, where the egos are small in the dressing room and there's less to juggle when it comes to backroom politics, which allows him more time and energy to do what he does best, surgically dissect his opponents. And when handed the right mid-table team, he is a god slayer. And it's quite apparent that in a tournament setting, for his high-profile teams, no one Absolutely no one will want to see Unai on that opposite touchline. He was once labeled a flop, a loser, a hack, but he didn't listen to the critics. Instead, he took his licks like a man, went back to the lab, put in the work, and in a few years' time, Unai Emery is maybe the most feared manager in world football, with a team that has the best chance to shock the Premier League since Leicester dared to dream in 2016. Can he do it? Well, to be honest, history's not kind. Despite his incredible cup runs with Sevilla, he was never able to lift them higher than fifth place in La Liga. And he only got Villarreal to seventh during his one full season there. But Unai and Aston Villa wouldn't be where they are now if they let their past dictate their futures. This is a manager and a team full of players that everyone had doubted, written off, and labeled them losers. 
and they could have accepted that. But instead, they refused those labels, rebuilt and retooled themselves into the most feared team in the Premier League. And because no one could ever see them as heroes, they decided to become the villains. And that is going to be my video on Unai Emery and Aston Villa. It's an incredible story. It's one of the greatest stories in sports going on right now. If you're going to root for one team and one team only, root for Aston Villa this year. It gets the people going. And yeah, just a quick thank you for a tremendous 2023. Make sure to leave a little like button if you did enjoy. More videos coming out for you soon. Big thanks to Lewis for helping me out of this video. You're the real MVP. And of course, as always, thank you to all the patrons. Keep me alive and well during all this BS. And yeah, until next time, boys, this is the Fat Asian saying stay thick. <laughs>